George, I think we first met each other probably 30 years ago when I was just starting out uh, in, in ministry. But you've been in ministry for how long? I guess about 55 years. Yeah. 50, you're looking good. <laughs> you need to check the eye doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, uh, but you got a platinum card uh, from United Airlines because you'd uh, flown one million miles. Yeah. Have you seen uh, that film with, uh, you know, Up in the Air with George yes, Clooney? Yes, yes. I relate to that. You relate to that, I know. Well, people sometimes say to me, um, how are you, J. John? And I say, well, there's not too much wrong with the model, it's the mileage. Yeah. And uh, you do feel the mileage, don't you, after a while. But let's hear a little bit about your, your own journey of faith, uh, George. Where, where would you say you began to believe in Jesus? Well, I think as a young uh, person in New Jersey, right outside New York City, that I must have begun to think about it a little bit when I was quite young because they, uh, my parents sent me off to Sunday school. It, it was not a church that was really uh, preaching the gospel or really manifesting any kind of dynamic uh, Christianity, but the message came out in the songs, but it wasn't really uh, gripping me. And so I was living my own selfish life. I had a very happy childhood. Can't remember even one ha unhappy day. I was in the sports. And then I went into business when I was like 12. And then I was very fortunate to lynch in, link in with a Jewish guy out of New York City who had this really new fire extinguisher. And so I went into business selling firefighting equipment. I guess I was 16, 15 by then. And soon had 200 people uh, working for me part-time selling this hot, selling fire extinguisher. I teach them how to uh, light a gasoline petrol fire in front of someone's house and then put it out really quick. So that really helped sell a lot of these. <laughs> my grandfather's actually, and my father, both from the Netherlands. You can see that on my global uh, yes. jacket. Uh, I just had nine great days over there. Uh, my other grandfather was Scottish, Irish, and English blood mix, which is, you know, I think it's, basically toxic. He was an alcoholic and my grandmother divorced him. So I didn't have a lot of spiritual legacy. And my life was really more sports and money and girls and business when a woman, a woman of prayer, if you want to live your own selfish life, you know, avoid those kind of women. And she put my name on her Holy Ghost hit list and not only prayed that I become a Christian, she prayed that I would become a missionary. Imagine she didn't even like discuss this with me. So um, get sent me a Gospel of John through the post. I began to read it, and, and the search, I think, began, even looking at different churches, uh, reading. And then Billy Graham, an evangelist, came to New York City, not for a crusade. That was a couple years later. He just came for one night. And a business guy gave me a free seat. I was big into anything free. Uh, gave me a free seat on a coach in New York City, and Brought one of these gals, of course, I was interested in. And I heard the gospel and was converted to Jesus that night. It's been a reality every day ever since. I know that isn't everybody's testimony. A lot no, of people have yours. slip away, but I've never lost that first love, that first reality, lots of struggles, some stupid sure. mistakes. Yes, sometimes sin, especially lust of the eyes, I think is my biggest thing next to impatience. I won't give you my other... 19 struggles now, it's a little depressing when you first get started. Yeah. So there's my story in a nutshell. So the, the lady that gave you the gospel, she was a neighbor? Lived near, across from the high school. Yeah. yeah back. And then straight away, you started telling friends at the school. Well, it took, I, I read this gospel for over a year, and then Billy Graham came. Yeah. Then straight away, I, because by then I was elected president of the student council, which is a big ego trip in our high school system in America, but they all had to listen to me. So I could share the gospel to the whole school. Then I got permission to give out gospels of John. That's illegal in the United States today. But in the 50s, they didn't have that mm -hmm. law. So a 1,000 students, uh, most of them all knew me. And they read the gospel of John. And a lot of people came to Jesus. And during Christmas break, they invited me back to that school. She had been praying 15 years. And her children were godly testimonies in that school. But they never saw a big breakthrough. But I came back Christmas break. Hundreds came out to hear me. And including my own father was wondering what was going on with his son. And when I gave an invitation to believe on Jesus, about 125 uh, stood up. I'm not saying they all no. became true believers. And among them, uh, my own father who followed Jesus 
till 94 Ten. years of age. That's so amazing. God heard the prayers of, of that woman in all of OM. 6,000 6, of us today, 160,000 yeah. have been on OM at some time. Can all be traced back to, to one praying one. woman. Marvelous. But you then went off to uh, Bible college. No, I went to university first. Uh, university I, of Mexico and also a secular, was Christian, but had become very, yeah. so almost anti-Christian place for a couple of years and then uh, Moody. Ended up at Moody. Yeah. And, and obviously had a heart for uh, mission around the world. I mean, w while you were at Bible college, were you, you were learning Spanish? Yeah, that started way back in high school. And my interest in now, I also owned a philatelic agency selling stamps for collectors. There's big money in that, not so much anymore. But uh, that, that got me linked in, in, without realizing with all these nations. Little did yeah. I know, Sam, did, someday I'd visit most of them. Oh. So my Spanish started in high school. And then I went to Mexico. Before I ever went to Moody, I went to Mexico and I saw that God could use me even though my Spanish was poor and it was a short-term summer trip. We saw God do great things. And that's why I left um, my liberal arts college and transferred to Moody. I wanted to get More. Uh, to the mission field. And I was exposed to uh, some amazing uh, writings. Books were the most inf greatest influence in my life. And even at college, I had teachers that were very unbelieving and I went through a great period of doubt, intellectual doubt. I almost threw the whole thing over. But books, uh, especially archaeology and the Bible by a guy named Joseph Free and then the writings of Billy Graham and Oswald Smith and others really helped me get an intellectual uh, strength to my, uh, to my faith. And in those early days of going to Mexico, you would um, take books and all types of literature to distribute. How, and, and I gather you tried to get onto the radio stations and things like that. You were quite creative and adventurous. Yeah, we did a lot of crazy things. They didn't all work. There was no radio, no Christian radio in Mexico at that time. The government was clamping down on the Catholic Church. That's a whole story. A lot of people don't realize that Mexico wanted to be more secular, you know, 100 years ago, and they clamped down on the Catholic Church so they couldn't have their religious radio programs. So evangelical, biblical Christians, and I'm sure there's some among the Catholics. And I've discovered a way to get around that by opening a Christian bookshop and advertising our products. So we advertise Christian records, it's just commercial business, played the records on the radio, talked about the, what's this record about? You know, the old days of these things that went around. And uh, so God opened the door for some of the first radio broadcasts. Then we went into correspondence courses and opened a lot of bookshops. You turned it all over to Mexicans because we had to go back to college. Sure. And that taught me the principle that our whole work was built on, turn it over to the national people as quickly as possible. So in the early days, these were your like summer vacation missions. And summer and Christmas. Yeah, summer and Christmas. Out of Mexico. Yeah. Very yeah. exciting, completely changed the course of my life and birthed a movement. Our movement was born in really in revival. The main thing wasn't firstly missions, that was always there, but it was getting right with God, walking in the light, experiencing the reality of the Holy Spirit, and that led to these nights of prayer that have spread all over the world and other meetings where people get right with God. Before people come on an OM campaign, they go to one of these powerful conferences. We bring in different uh, men and women of God and call people to repentance. And then they go out on the uh, evangelism. Yeah. Right. Where did you meet your wife? That's an amazing story. I had a lot of trouble with girls. And then I started to move into the world of pornography just in a very small way. But there was money in that. And then after I became a Christian, and I didn't know whether, because, you know, I was, in those days we mainly kissed, and, you know, we didn't jump in bed and have sex so, so quickly. So I've been kissing girls since 11, and I became a believer, and I was hoping, you know, there might be a clear verse, thou shalt not kiss. <laughs> <laughs> there was no verse, so I kept kissing everything <laughs> available. And I'd lead, I led a girl to Christ, and I was kissing her for an hour, and then uh, it got really messy. And God just one day in the, in, the, in the car park of a church was they began to neck up a storm uh, kissing this girl. And um, God just hit me that this, this is, you know, this is a dead end street. Plus, it's a lie. I would tell these girls, you know, I love you when, in fact, this was, you know, sort of recreation. And God just hit me. So I went on cold turkey. No more dates, no more kissing, a little bit with a pillow. And um, that lasted almost a year and a half. That's when I went to Mexico. That's when God completely overhauled my life, taught me about spiritual warfare and prayer, the reality of the Holy Spirit. That's when I transferred 
to Moody. Now I arrive at Moody Bible Institute. I'm still mm. a young Christian. Yeah. A lot of these Christian girls carrying big Bibles are quite attractive. I was infatuated with about seven in the first week crying out for mercy. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't do anything. I didn't, no. you know, I'm really com radically committed to Jesus. But then I um, went to a rent a film, a Christian film, Moody Science film, and the woman in charge of the films, it was too much. <clears throat> I remember to this day just seeing her when I got out of the lift, sitting there at the desk. It's just too much. Rom my romantic circuits blew. I broke my fast, moved in on the target, <laughs> said something totally stupid. Uh, for me, it was love at first sight. For her, it was fright. At first, <laughs> at first sight. And then I managed to get her on sort of a date. It was like an interrogation because I thought, this is too good to be true. The devil might be getting in here. Yeah. So I tried to scare away. I said, look, probably nothing going to happen between you and me, but you need to know. You know, if anything did, hint, 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 if anything did, I'm going to be a missionary. And if you marry me, you'll probably be eaten by cannibals in New Guinea. You told her that. Yeah, I told her that. Yeah. I was later counseled that wasn't the best way to win a woman's heart, but it was too late. Yes. So she was not interested, but I mobilized my prayer intercessor movement, and uh, God broke her heart. I gave her that key scripture. She was a little naive, very young in the Lord, and she started to think that I was a man of God and a Bible teacher because all the stories about Mexico among the students. And so I took her into that key verse, you know, submit unto your husband as unto the Lord. She agreed, so I asked her to marry me. She did, and uh, asked her to sell everything she had. She did be a millionaire today because she inherited a lot of money from her father killed in the war. Uh, we, I didn't believe honeymoon, then he was straight to Mexico into evangelism, didn't believe in spending money for an, a flat. Well, so you didn't have a honeymoon? Well, first of all, you gave away your engagement ring. Yeah, that's before that, yeah. Yeah, so you had an engagement ring. But we had some you, kind of ring, I don't know. Yeah, but then you, you, you heard of someone else that needed one, and you gave, yeah, it away. I gave it away. I was big into esteeming other, you know, you can take any verse to extreme. You have to let yeah. one verse bring other verse into balance. So esteeming others better than yourself led me to some really cockeyed oh. behavior, especially once you're married. So but someday. praise God, the marriage went really well, I mean, for several weeks. <laughs> then but, she read the other verses. <laughs> started to express her viewpoint. But wait a minute. Right. We're working on that 52 years later. later. So you got married on a Sunday, and on Monday you went to Mexico on a mission. Yeah, we left Sunday night. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I didn't and, believe in big stopped. weddings. The wedding was just after the church But you service. had no money. And so what you were doing is selling the wedding cake at the gas station. Well, we had some money, but we didn't want to spend it. That was for books and Bibles. So we were praying that God would get us to Mexico without spending money. And then you offered... I, I you had offered two wedding cakes. They ate one. I, I hid the other one away. Or, and I offered that to the petrol station. It just blew him away. It just gave me petrol. I did it again the next morning. He was a Christian. Gave me oil change and petrol. Well, so you said, look, give me petrol, I'll give you the cake. Yeah, but the, the first two didn't want it. They just said, just go, you know. Uh, but but the third the... guy wanted the cake. He took the cake? Yeah. So. Uh, but you got to Mexico. Yeah. We had to uh, find a place to sleep, especially it's January, it was cold. So I went to a pastor's house, I got his name in the phone book, Cold Turkey. I said, you know, we're missionaries going to Mexico, can we stay at your house? It blew him away, he gave us the master's bedroom. And when he said goodbye, he gave me a dollar, which was an answer to prayer because I had broke my commitment and already spent a dollar the night before to buy a cup of hot chocolate. My new wife one day, who was wondering what she got into, I, I could see she needed something. It was a little cold driving through the night. So I gave her this, uh, spent a dollar on hot chocolate and prayed that I'd get it back. And that pastor the next morning gave me a dollar back to send us on the way. Oh. <laughs> I've been seeing God supply every, yeah. <laughs> ever since. So, go on. After college, you end up going to Spain because... College, marriage, Mexico for six months. And then... Then Spain. Spain. Yeah. While you're in Spain, you start learning Russian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because, you, because you want to go to Russia. Yeah. I wanted to be God's smuggler. I ended up God's bungler. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, another story. That's another story. Right. From Spain, you go to Russia. You get arrested in Russia. And they think you're a spy. Yeah. So how did you get out of that? Well, just to jump back a little, the vision yes. I had was mainly Muslim world, closed countries, and communist countries. I had got very linked with a lot of missionaries at Moody. I esteemed other missions. I was not really a renegade. that I may have appeared that way. I really loved other missionaries, Lionel Gurney and Red Sea Mission Team, uh, a man named Steele of African, yes. North African Mission. Uh, but... 
God just kept pushing me as I was getting this burden for Afghanistan and Iraq and Turkey. These countries were the big thing. Hardly anyone was working there. Many weren't planning to work there. Um, people said they're not responding. And I thought that is what God's called me to for my life. And my best friend, Dale, who went to Mexico with me originally, he was going to join Wycliffe, and then he got involved with a, a local church movement. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest days in my life, I went out. He was at Wheaton College. I was at Moody. And I went out, and I said, Dale, I wonder if you'd rejoin. God's doing something. We want to go to the Muslim world. And he did a U-turn, joined me, pioneered Turkey. We've been together for 54 years. He's still growing, wow. going strong. But through my first effort in Russia, it was a real, you know, a real failure. Failure can be the back door to success, by the mm. way. There's a great book by that title. I recommend it. I mm. haven't read it, but the title uh, touched my heart. <laughs> failure, <laughs> uh, the back door to uh, <laughs> yeah, success. It's... So it was really through that failure, eventually they decided I was a religious fanatic and took all the stuff I had and let us Gave us a machine gun escort. But, but you took to a Austria. printing machine, though. A you small took, printing device, hid, hidden. You hid the Bibles in the um, well. They were in cornflakes boxes, and it was very poor. Later on, this is so amazing. For 25 years later on, OM became the most sophisticated smugglers, perhaps in the history of the Christian Church. 25 years, even when the guards knew there were Bibles in these vehicles, they could not find them. The most sophisticated panelled vehicles done by. Uh, people who learn how to do it. But under me, it was a fiasco. That's when I went for this famous day of prayer when God gave me the vision for the UK and the rest of Europe. Well, this is when you got kicked out of yeah. Russia. Yeah, day of prayer, gave me the name Operation Mobilization, changed the vision so Western Europe became uh, really the big thing that the church in Western Europe would mobilize, not OM, but the church and reach the communist world and the Muslim world and the closed countries. And I've had the joy now for 50 years since I moved to that. London, seeing God do that. So just to recap, you, you get kicked out of Russia. This is then in Austria, you go up a tree for a day of prayer. In mountains, yeah. Yeah, and you, and you went and sat on a tree. Yeah, well, just for that, for a few hours, but that's yeah. where I got the name Operation Mobilization. You know, God sort of has a sense of humor. Got down from there, went to India. No, then I had to go back to Spain, see if the Spaniards would join me. Yes. Then I moved to the UK, and God had prepared the UK for this message, a very strong message on commitment and revival, and God, Cambridge, Oxford, every university was ripe. I just went from university to university, and in the next couple of years, literally thousands uh, responded and went into global missions, many with OM, and of course, many with other people. Sure. Yeah. But you did end up in India. Later and, on. Yeah. And then in India, you, you got kicked out of India. That was uh, after several years. Yes. You know, through and another stupid mistake. We were selling our possessions, and it was doing so well, all the new recruits bring extra possessions. We never smuggled anything, but they brought their full quota. And we had all the quota in one apartment. And somebody gossiped to the customs, these are guys are smugglers. They raided that department. And you'd never convince them that we weren't smugglers because the people had left their stuff. They were scattered across the nation. So I was arrested. My good friend, Mike Wiltshire, who ended up with the Financial Times, was arrested. And then my name was submitted. The court case was like a joke, really. The judge just warned us. He knew that we weren't that kind of people. I had a good lawyer, but our name went to the blacklist. God used that to force me uh, to put the work into the hands of nationals right away. And I had leadership courses in Nepal. You don't need visas yes. for Nepal. The Indians would come there. I'd do these leadership training courses and revival meetings, and then they'd go back to India. And that's the work of all the work OM does. India is the most blessed. We've got about 3,000 churches in our network. We have 3,000 staff. We've opened 107 schools among the Dalits. We have the largest, huge uh, literature ministry books, shops all over the nation. And I think it's partly because we put that work in the hands of the Indians yes. at the earliest stage and gave ourselves to leadership training. Tell us, George, how did these ships begin? How, where did you get, how, where was the vision birthed? Yeah, that's a mystery. But I, I first came to Europe on the Queen Elizabeth. That would be the old one. And so ships started to get into my uh, thinking, especially the fact that you could travel and do so much at the same time. I became very extreme on redeeming the time. I mean, really, it was quite bad at times. And never happy with, like, doing two things at once. You always want, like, three or four. It really gets on people's nerves, especially 
my wife. But anyway, that's a separate story. So I came to Europe on the Queen Elizabeth. I went back to America once on the Queen, taking loads of books. And, and then I went to India on a ship. But then when we had a, the big summer of 63, when OM yes. exploded and 2,000 people came to Paris, I, I got all the vehicles up just before they hit the scrapyards in London. Big, big heavy lorries to carry teams and carry literature. So we were always paying uh, for these uh, you know, vehicles to go across the channel. So it's really the English Channel. And the, then I went to India once on a ship that thought, we, we now had hundreds of vehicles crisscrossing the whole Middle East and India, reaching, I mean, literally tens of millions with the gospel. It just seemed logical now as I looked at all the water on, the, uh, in the, on our planet that we should have a ship. And so I shared this actually in a converted pub in Bolton, Lancashire, where I was living. And uh, slowly, it took me several years to persuade because we always work more as a team. Yes. Uh, the rest that we should do this. And God gave me a captain and a chief engineer before I had a ship. We did a lot of research. And God has blessed that ship ministry more than we actually envisaged. It's 41 years of ship ministry. It's given the gospel to 100 million. It's trained thousands. Of the 160,000 who have been on OM, about 25,000 are in leadership around That's the globe. Incredible. Uh, many of them in their local church. No, they're not no. with us. We never put yeah. pressure to no. stay with us. So you've had uh, four, is it the Logos? The Logos, Doulos, Doulos, Logos, Logos two, 2, and now and Logos, Logos Hope. Hope. Yeah, we just have one now, but it's bigger than all those three put together. And basically been to hundreds of ports. About 120. Yeah, yeah. many of them more than once. Many of them more than once. Yeah. And so just explain the mechanics. The, the ship arrives at a port. What does OM do? It's planned in advance. When there are churches, the churches are, are involved. It's like a mini spiritual invasion. The radio, television, so many things open up to you when you're a ship. We have these VIP receptions. It might be, you know, even Libya. And the daughter of Gaddafi a couple of years ago came to the ship. Libya even gave us free fuel. So this, this ship attracts the attention of non-Christians, government people, uh, merchant navy people, especially this giant book exhibit, the largest floating book exhibit in the world, which is 70% educational children in general book, 30% Christian. It changes in Libya, <laughs> it changes to 90 to 10. Even we got in China, yes. though China didn't let us sell books. So it's... Um, the conferences that go on, book exhibit, film ministry, onshore mass distribution, personal evangelism, coffee bar. About 10 ministries are all going on at the same time, and it really has proven to be an effective way to partner with the church to accomplish something in these great cities of the world. Even in London, 28,000 visitors came in London to Lagos Hope. Uh, and, and Canary Wharf, one bank closed the whole uh, floor, sent all their people down on the ship, and said if 40 nationalities can live together on that ship, you ought to go and see how they're doing it. And so um, even in Canary Wharf, we made an impact for Jesus. And then also uh, many of your teams in the locations that you go to go out to the people. Oh, yeah. And you respond to the Even port. when the ship lately has been in dry dock for uh, some repairs, teams scattered all over the Philippines with literature, preaching. One of the fastest growing parts of our work now is our global arts ministry, and then we have global sports ministries, so they're doing all kinds of things. The heart of all of this is obviously uh, the Lord, his spirit, uh, kind of his compassion to reach the lost. Absolutely. Why, why do you think, do you think the church has lost the heart of that? Well, I think we have to be honest. Many churches never had it. You know, we, we can talk about the good old days, but it's always been a minority of people that are really, you know, we can't judge, but really seem to be filled with the Spirit and sharing their faith. They're in the prayer meeting. They're loving people. You know, they're putting it into practice. I think generally that's always been a minority. Some churches that are really alive and they've got good leadership, you know, a huge percentage of the church. And I have the privilege of going often to those kind of churches. And I believe the church globally and, and in England and uh, even in the States, is a lot healthier than some people make yes. it out. There's a lot of prophets of doom. Their books sell really well. People sort of like uh, negative stuff. But, you know, God is working in his church in the midst of the complexity and the mess because God is way more forgiving than us. Yes. And it's, uh, I have a favorite term. I invented it myself called messiology. 
Uh, it's based on my George Verwer proverb, which is not going to get in the Bible. I, I don't know, even know how to go about that. And uh, it's uh, where two or three of the Lord's people are gathered together, sooner or later there's a mess. <laughs> and that can be yeah. quite discouraging if you yes. have a, real, a wrong viewpoint. Sure. But if you understand the mercy and the graces of God and the power of the blood of Christ, then you realize God can use people when they're baby Christians or when they have blind spots. or when They might even be on an ego trip. Sure. I, terrible things have been said to me about Christian leaders. And it's, uh, it's hurt me that people misjudge Christian yeah. leaders. You know, all the Nigerians, they're all on an ego trip. And all these people, they're all just building their own empire. We have all these generalizations. You know, God is way more merciful than we are. God's love and grace works with people. We're all in a pilgrimage. We do fail. Ego does sometimes lock in. And one of the, God, one of the things God uses is a surprise some people to hear this. I've never had the total victory over lust and pornography. I'm like, I'm like an alcoholic. And I was encouraged reading the writings of Brennan Manning and mm. Ragamuffin Gospel, one of my favorite books, that God used him when he's still struggling with alcohol, even serious failure. I've not a lot, I had a lot of failure, but I've had enough to really make me feel bad and feel that I can never be used of God. But because of grace and forgiveness, and I wanted to resign, of course, years ago from any leadership, I don't really like leadership, but because of grace and forgiveness and the work of the Holy Spirit, and brothers and sisters who love me, especially my wife, somehow I picked myself up, was cleansed and, and pressed on. And that's the message I'm preaching all over the world. And I have more invitations and more reception than ever before in my whole life. And uh, I thank the Lord that he was so patient with me. Well, as with all of us, George, tell us, you obviously have a global um, experience, first-hand experience. Um, you know, Operation Mobilization is in, what, over 110 countries? About 110 countries. 110 countries. Okay, For, from what you know in the world, tell us at the moment, you know, what's happening? What's happening in terms of those who don't yet know about Jesus? Well, we know the world's a mess. I mean, just look at Syria right now. Just rip your heart out what's going on in Syria, a country that's been on my heart 50 years. And it's easy to look and see the mess and... Just be overwhelmed by it. But in the midst of it, God is doing greater, great things. This is the greatest harvest of people to Christ the world has ever known. China may be up around 100 million now. I've just been in a conference about China. Uh, Brazil has 50 million believers. Maybe somebody said half are backslidden. But still, it's, it's a miracle. We're seeing the biggest harvest we've ever seen in almost 50 years of work in India. And this, this harvest, even here in Europe, even yes. here in the UK through Alpha and many other things we don't always know about, the harvest is still coming in here in the UK. It's not, you know, it isn't South Korea, it isn't Brazil, and British people have an easy tendency to get down on themselves, but God is at work here, and God is at work. I've just been in the Netherlands. People think nothing's going on in the Netherlands. I just spoke on two weekends at two biggest churches in the country. One had 3,000, one had 2,500. You know, I would have, it's all in the last 10 or 20 years. Mm. So God is doing great things. He wants to do more. He wants to see more making Christ Lord. He wants to see more filled with the Spirit. In a sense, you know, the black hole of need is always there, including in Operation Mobilization. But in the midst of it, through prayer and mercy, God is doing great things. And I'm just privileged to still be alive. Sure. Some of my friends have gone on to glory. I'm what we call in London an old geezer. Yes. But I took 300 meetings last year and uh, seen tens of thousands make decisions. I don't believe there's any retirement program in the Bible. It's just a lot of change. And I'm already strategizing for when I have to stay in bed and operate from there. And how, how, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I got a Blackberry. I got a laptop and a phone. What else do you need? My wife will bring me my food. <laughs> As you look back, George, over the, these 50 years, um, you know, do you have any kind of regrets? Oh, lots of regrets, but someone told me, it was either Lloyd-Jones or A.W. Tozer, both men influenced my life, that um, regret is the most subtle form of self-love. And so I'm a, I'm a, potentially could have a lot of regrets. I wasn't, I don't think, the best father. I'm not the kind of person that's the best, really, at anything. I wasn't the best husband. I wasn't the best leader. Uh, one thing I feel is I, I wish I had been more approachable. I wish I had more of the message of grace yes. that I have now when I was younger. It was coming in there, and I would quickly repent 
Calvary Road was one of my favorite books. When Roy Hessian went to heaven, he dumped it all on me. I'm in charge of the Roy Hessian Trust. It's the only thing I'm in that has any money. Uh, the money goes to get Calvary Road and we would see Jesus in that book on yes. sexual repentance all over the world in many, many uh, languages. That book came in in the early days and helped me to repent of hurting my wife and, uh, and other people and ask forgiveness. So I started practicing that from the early days. And so people that I offended or I wasn't that approachable, I felt I was unfriendly, um, Whenever I hear about it, I'd apologize. Sometimes, of course, I'm emotional. It would be with tears. Yeah. And they became some of my closest friends. They're with me, too. You know, yeah. many hundreds, thousands have stayed with me in this ministry, totally loyal. And some of them given just amazing money also to keep it going. Our biggest supporters, many of them, are people who once served on OM. Yes. You know, all over the world. 160,000 of them. So uh, do, you think, do you think we, the church, could do more? Absolutely, and I, and I can do more. I mean, there's always greater challenges, always greater scope. In fact, my life completely changed 10 years ago when I embraced holistic ministry. Before that, OM was preaching, church planting, discipleship, every kind of evangelism you can think of. But 10 years ago, we, through the influence of the Lausanne Congress and other things, we, we believed, and Joseph D'Souza, probably one of the best leaders I've ever had, leads the whole work in India, has written a number of books. He showed us, and Tony Campalo influenced me, and Ron Sider, and a lot of other guys from Latin America and Africa, that, that proclamation can come together with social action. doesn't mean everybody does everything. That's ridiculous. You yes. have to find your niche. Sure. But God, because we are a large movement, we, we had to start doing more social action and so social transformation. So I got into the impure water thing, the sex traffic thing, AIDS thing, uh, you name it, I'm probably involved as an advocate and through literature. I have projects. Uh, the only thing I lead in OM is called special projects, a little niche part of OM that I'm fully responsible to find the money and spend the money, and it, it's just a pure joy to be able to put money in the situations you know that really are strategic. For yes. me, it's still 80% basic evangelism, but I got a 20% for holistic emergency situations, medical situations. Just in India, rebuilt a young woman's face. It didn't really cost that much in Delhi, whose face was totally destroyed in a fire. And now we have uh, 30, 40,000 in our uh, schools in India. These are schools for the untouchables. They have no money, they're poverty stricken, and they often come to school malnourished, so now we're giving them lunches. So this is really the most exciting period in OM's history, and I've been out of all the leadership for nine years, and I'm just as excited as when I was, uh, you know, the international director. So wh what is it that's needed? Is it more workers? Is it more money? What, I think, more firstly, prayer? more radical commitment to Jesus, and I would ask people to pick up that new book. It's a little bit American. It's written for Americans, how to, how to deal with the American dream, called Radical by David Platt. Now, books like that, pure missions, discipleship, reality, they generally don't sell. We've had books like that all these 50-some years. Peter Maiden even wrote one. Yes. Uh, John Stott wrote one. But generally, they don't sell that well. But David Platt's book hit New York Times bestseller, and whew, it took off like the shack yes. and uh, Purpose Driven Life. Uh, this is the most significant book right now, at least in North America. Hundreds of thousands are making greater commitments of their lives to, to Jesus, to missions, to releasing the funds, to living a more simple lifestyle in order to release more money for world evangelism, which was our whole message you know, yeah. of the 60s. We needed David Platt to remind us sure. in the midst of our heavy emphasis on grace not to lose the emphasis on radical discipleship. We need both. So do you think God is calling more people into missions? Yes, all the time, but I think first locally. And I believe being called into... Uh, Work in the city in a bank can be just as much a mission field as going to India and planting a church. And I think one of the reasons so many business people support our work so thoroughly is because we really esteem people in the marketplace. Yes. You know, John Stott spoke about the other 98%. One of yeah. my highlights this year was the Jubilee. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, even saw the queen as she came out of St. Paul's. Uh, but another highlight in St. Paul's was the... Uh, the memorial service of John Stott, yes. who initially I offended.
because I gave a typical Verwer message, 1968, he was at Urbana, the Bible teacher. I was just a young, loudmouth American, and I, I didn't use many scriptures. I gave my testimony and told them all to repent of their porno and, uh, and uh, sex sin because I knew that's what these kids were into. 4,000 stood and repented, and the Holy Spirit worked, but John Stott took me aside, and um, the man I already admired, he really exhorted me. I think he was a little rougher then than his latter years and rebuked me for not having enough scripture. I did have one right at the end. I just <laughs> stood in front of John Stott and tried like a little baby. And yet, and he had heard that we were the Pied Piper of Cambridge. There's a lot of negative stuff against yes. OM in those days. And as soon as I got back to England, we had tea together and we met together almost every year after that and became very close friends, though we're, we're as different as chalk and cheese. Yes. We found out we were way more like-minded Yes. Especially when we ministered together once on the, on the ship. And I visited him before he we went to heaven. It's just an example that in Christ, even people who are so different from us, and we may initially offend them, God can bring us together and accomplish his purposes. So to distill... Uh, some... You were a lot easier to relate to, I must confess. <laughs> <laughs> um... You're slightly different than John Stott. I don't know if you realize no. that. Oh, did you know? The, I, John... But he wants to see you when you get to heaven. Oh, I know. There'll be quite but, a crowd around but, him, but you, you know, know, you can work your way through. Yeah, you know, when I started as an evangelist, George, uh, John Stott invited me to go and have tea uh, in his um, apartment. So, Amazing experience, right? Yeah, go there and we have tea and everything else, and we're talking. And he, he says to me, So, um, how do you spend time with God? And, you know, how do you have a quiet time? And I was thinking, hmm, how do I have a quiet time? So I said, well, well what about you then, you know? <laughs> uh, misdirection. And um, I heard how he spent time. And then he said, brother, shall we pray? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's pray, let's pray, you know, like this. And then he starts praying. But the, it, the sound sounds a little bit different. So I kind of opened my eyes, and he's lying prostrate on the floor. Whoa. So I thought, oh, dear. <laughs> so I got down as well. And that was my first yeah. real experience of unless One of the thrilling things bowing. is we can still distribute his books. His yeah. God is using his books in many languages. And that's they're the kind of books we distribute from the ship. It's great. Yeah. But if you, right, distilling some of your experience and your knowledge and what you've seen and what you sense God is doing, what would you advise, say, a church, as a local church, and their leadership. What kind of advice would you give them? I think, first of all, love one another. That's the bottom line, 1 Corinthians 13. You know, we have some pastors in the States now, and I'm not, I don't want to judge them, I'm just talking about it theoretically, that they, they feel they're just called to preach, and uh, they don't get involved with people, they don't like visit people. I believe that's wrong. They may not be able to visit many, they don't have to be the visitation pastor, but how can any of us be human and be committed to the, re the revolution of love that 1 Corinthians 13 teaches and not visit people in their homes and, and, and have that. We all have to have a pastoral role. It's not just the yes. pastor. We all have to be available. It's, others call it the ministry of encouragement. And uh, I just thank God for so many very ordinary people that I'm linked with that encourage me. I battle discouragement every day. My kind of temperament, the way I'm wired, Disappointment, discouragement, it's there every day. And if you get 100 emails a day from all over the world of people's problems and crises, uh, you know, discouragement comes in. Things like Syria for me and these other global problems, not only discouraging, but I've so struggled with suffering that at times I've almost lost, you know, lost my way and lost my faith. Yes. And um, I think in, uh, mystery has become a key word in my life that some of these things will never fully understand. We pray for one person, they're healed. We pray for other people the same way. And, you know, they seem to die very quickly. So I just thank the Lord for mercy and grace and forgiveness. But the key thing in the church, love one another. Church is generally, if there's a strong, visionary, dynamic person, he needs to slow down a little bit, smell the roses, try to understand why people appear to be lukewarm. Many people are hurting Many people have been hurt by other Christians. Many people have been through dysfunctional church situations. Churches that 30, day, 30 years ago were promising all kinds of things to this now older generation. We're old enough to know many of those things never happened. And even these new churches, many, many people have been hurt in these new churches. 
Leaders have fallen away. Some have drifted away. And so we need to understand people better, discernment, and get to know them personally rather than just lay our heavy thing on them, which I'm very gifted at. That doesn't mean we don't, in the end, go for radical discipleship. Yes, but with radical grace and lots of love mingled into everything we do and, and to guard our tongues. And I'm so ashamed of hurtful things that I've said to my own wife and a miracle that I ever made it through because I've got this big mouth and I just believe that we need to guard our tongues. Uh, God wants us to be loving and kind people and I think that's the thing that stood out with me with John Stott. Now, he wasn't tested as much as I was because he never married. And the marriage... <laughs> Yeah, really. Marriage is God's PhD program in sanctification. And uh, I thought I was doing really well in my spiritual life until I got married. So, uh, and then children, and now grandchildren. Of course, people are always saying grandchildren are wonderful. You know, Tony Campala says, grandchildren, that's God's prize to you for not killing off your own kids. <laughs> but now we discover that grandchildren also can be quite a... Uh, Quite a challenge. So when in there, there's some of my thoughts. There's some of your heart. Now, you've been wearing um, a jacket like that for About years. About 20 years, yeah. 20 years. How, what, when did it start? Well, everybody's wanting audiovisuals. They're always wanting to know, what's your PowerPoint? I was never very good at those things, so I just wore this jacket. And I have global underwear that goes with it, but <laughs> I, I can't. Just, no. My wife doesn't what, want me. What, with the map of the world? Yeah, yeah. But really? My wife doesn't want me to display that anymore. No. No, I've got my, my global umbrellas in the car because it's raining today. I've got yes. global shower curtains, global you know, mattress covers. You know, I'm a little extreme. You never notice that. No, just a little. <laughs> but go on. So do you get those made? No, a little company makes these. They've got a patent on this. It's called uh, Tyrex. Yes. And... Um, so I, I, I sell these, auction them. Sometimes I give them free. It's a real, especially, I have a missions conference, and maybe the pastor who led the way in the missions conference, at the very end, I take my jacket off and present it to the pastor, and that really wins the day. I do that a lot. And you've, au you've auctioned quite a few. Yeah, I, for, uh, for I'm world not missions. usually there when they auction them, but once I left one on our ship, and in Ireland, our leader in Ireland was a really gun-ho kind of a character. We were raising, we had a, needed a lot of money for the new ship, and so we auctioned the jacket and got 50,000 pounds from oh, a dear, uh, dear nice. lady. She was praying about giving it for a long time, but the jacket sort of, you know, lit the fire. That's amazing. I'm in touch with her. Yeah. Uh, to, to fund all, the, all, all of this, George, all the ships, all the ministries and 110 countries, um, obviously the Lord is Jehovah Jireh, uh, how's, it, how's it come through over 50 years? Yeah, I think it's easy to make generalizations, and the one that makes us always seem more spiritual is to say prayer. Well, prayer is the heart of our movement and my own life. Yes. But God is calling also us to work hard. And in, in the complex world in which we live today, more than ever, we need clear communication. And people who give finance, whether it's a church or an individual, they really want to know how the money's being used. They want to know if there's accountability. They want to know who my board is. We've always had strong boards. You know, the godly lawyer from Manchester, Mr. Val Grieva, wrote that book on the resurrection. Yes. He was our chairman for many, many years. And he went to glory I knew rather Val. quickly. I knew yeah, him. Most people did. Yes. So we're always fortunate to have good board. I've always been accountable to people. We always had good accountants. And God has blessed that. So prayer first, and then hard work, good communication, loving people is tied in there. And a lot of times the, the gifts and the finance just come as sort of a byproduct of just living the Christian life. Loving people, encouraging people, people who loved us and their life was changed through us. Uh, I remember one lady in the Isle of Wight when she went to glory, you know, 100,000 pounds uh, came our way from, from her will. Uh, we'd been, of course, in it a long time. In the early days, we weren't in these kind of amounts of money at all. And we lived very, people thought we were very extreme, looking for rent-free. I'm only in Bromley because of all the rent-free places. I got in Bromley through a property man, Mr. Frampton, who went to glory. And there we are still, uh, we, we still have one of the uh, Deal Gloria Trust's properties yes. as yes. our hospitality house right there in, in Bromley. Uh, and, and partnership with the churches. 
We have thousands of churches in, in partnership with us. Yes. So their pastors visit us or they send young people and we send people back. And of course, a tremendous variety because of all the challenges that, that face every local church. Are you encouraged? I'm encouraged pretty well every day. I have to battle sometimes through a lot of things to get there. I'm praising the Lord all day long. I've never had a boring day in my Christian life. I've had some boring hours. And my wife and I at our age, we're actually asking the Lord uh, for some boring hours, especially my wife. I remember years ago, she looked at me and said, you know, looking at you, darling, makes me feel tired. And so, I'm, you know, I'm really trying to find the balance. But uh, I stay encouraged, repentance, praise. I mean, now with all this praise music and we can listen to it even on our phone, we have no excuse. Repentance, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> praise music. Graham Kendrick is a great friend. I mean, just listen to some of his really old stuff. Yes. One of the things I find interesting is I go to many churches. There's so many songs now, and the music team seem to have a lot more control than the old days. They're always wanting to do their new songs. <laughs> so I love contemporary music. Yeah. I love all kinds of songs, but they keep changing them. Can't we ever th sing even something that uh, was written like 10 years ago? <laughs> so it's, a, it's an exciting day in the music world. Yeah, but do you think, like, you know, it says in the word, uh, sing me a new song, sometimes he gets tired of the old ones? Yeah, I think that's gone extreme myself. <laughs> I think we need both. We need ancient and, and now, modern, old don't song, we? we're talking Graham Kendry. I You're know. You're probably thinking of William Booth. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you view uh, the process of the second coming in relation to all the nations being reached. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm still working on those things. I used to think I knew what I believed. Uh, you know, I'm just being honest with you that uh, I've read so many books and I have so many friends that believe different things, amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, mid-trib, post-trib. So I think really now I'm more pan, pan millennial. But, you know, it'll all pan out <laughs> in the end. But I believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus. I, I preach that. I believe also it can really happen at any time, even if someone doesn't believe that. Sure. If they're humble, they'll admit they might be wrong. And so the Lord Jesus could come at any time for them as well. All they need is a little humility to admit they might be wrong. Preaching the gospel to all the nations, is that a prerequisite for the second coming of Christ? I personally don't think that's uh, clear enough, but I respect people who believe that because nations now, those who have studied that, we no longer talk about nations, Libya, Tunisia, India. We talk about peoples. And of course, many peoples have not had the gospel at all. So it may be true. It may be true. And uh, I think Oswald J. Smith, who influenced me yes. a lot, may have believed that. Yes. And, you know, I'm not sure I do or not, but uh, hallelujah, if that motivates someone... Let's go for it. Yeah. For the majority of us, George, AK, you know, we've got, we've got families, got responsibilities, we've got jobs, mortgages, we've got all of that. So how do we fit how we serve God first in our local church, in our local community, our Jerusalem? And, and holding that together, how do we also think globally? Yeah, I don't think it's easy. But we have lots of models of all kinds of people, even with families of, of, of 10 and 15. My friend Jack Walker has 15 children. Uh, he has 100 grandchildren. He has 20 great-grandchildren. You know, I think he's, you know, gone a little far, but it's true. I'm not giving you any exaggeration. I was just on the phone with him. But he still thinks globally. He, he supports our work. He's been poor all of his life. Oh, guess why? And, uh, <laughs> but now some of his son-in-laws... Uh, or sending him some money, and so he tied uh, some of that money to me. And uh, even if we have a limited amount of time, we can use that to, to pray for the nations. It doesn't take long to pray for the nations. And that's why I brought this yes. uh, book to give to you. This is a Tell gift us. to you. Thank this you. is the new edition of Operation World. Um, I remember when this book was on my desk, when we first started Send the Light. Send the Light was eventually the name we gave to our publishing and a literature arm. And eventually that became separate about 30 years ago, a separate company. It was an interesting day in my life when I 
spun that out, but uh, I believe it was from the Lord, and it moved to Carlisle. Yes. But way before that, this book in its old edition, which did not sell, uh, was on my desk. Even bookshops returned copies. And I gave it to Jerry Davey, my director of publishing. I said, let's publish this again with a new cover. Around the same time, Patrick Johnston, the original author, joined our ship. So, you know, a relationship was there. Sure. Since then, a couple million copies of this book in many languages have gone out across the world. This new edition, so important, that for the Cape Town Big Lausanne event two years yeah. ago, they flew in 500 copies because it was just off the press because they knew this is a book that leaders need. Hmm. I prayed through it, the old edition. It's put in the form of a prayer diary to go through over the whole year. And then you'll constantly use it as a reference book. It really is uh, an outstanding uh, book. Up-to-date information, prayer on every nation in the world. But we don't talk about nations so much in missiology. Sure. Don't confuse with messiology, yes. which is my thing. Uh, we talk about people's groups. And Whitcliffe is targeting people's groups to give them their language, you know, the Bible in their language. And so we have a, we have a long way to go yet. Probably so, one-third so, of the world has not heard the gospel. One-third? About one-third. It used to be much higher than that. But there's been a lot of mass evangelism. I started a little club a couple years ago called the 100 Million Club. And you're, you or your organization couldn't join my club. It isn't really much. It's just a concept. If they hadn't given the gospel to 100 million, that's a lot of people. And uh, there are now 40 organizations that are part of that club. This grabbed the mind of my friend Lindsey Brown, who's now the yeah. international director of uh, Lausanne. He was the head of IFES for years, ex-OMR. Oxford guy, met him when I preached at Oxford. And he, he, he asked me to speak to leaders of the Lausanne movement in Boston about this concept. And uh, I think there's an increased interest now in making sure everybody in the world hears the gospel at least once. We know that's not enough. But Hudson Taylor said, if hear, hearing it once is not enough, what do we say of never hearing it at all? So this is, this is still, but we're doing so many other doing things. Some, yeah. This is still one of our greatest passions. And even today, I had information that one team of several teams in a big Hindu mela in North India, where I now go every year, and I'm allowed back in India, reached or gave the gospel out to 100,000 people at that one Hindu mela. So though in our work now, it's church planting and schools and all these other things, it's exciting to still yes. be able to reach the masses uh, with the word of God. So you can look up in this book. Um, any like nation. Any nation of the world. And, and all it, kinds of other information, organizations. And it, yes, and, and it basically, so I'm looking up my country of Cyprus. origin, Cyprus. And so you Maybe basically, place. you've given the history of it, the geography, you've explained all the people groups there, you've explained what's happening in terms of Christianity and how to pray. And you've got basically every country in the world. Yeah. I mean, this really should be accompanying every follower of Christ with their Bible. I think so. If they can possibly afford it, if they can't, people legitimately can't afford it, they can get it free from me. I'm very easy to find. You Google in my name and you'll find quite a lot, including my new exercise program in the jumbo jet toilet. But, uh, <laughs> so... Or you could go direct to georgeverward.com. And I offer more free books than any website in the entire world. Exciting. Well, Tell us forward. about some of those other books. Well, this is my newest book, Drops from a Leaking uh, Tap. Um, it's just uh, looking at a whole lifetime. It's my legacy book, trying to pass on things that God uh, gave to me. Each chapter is sort of uh, somewhat on its own. It's the first book in which I share my shift into holistic ministry called The Seven Global Scourges. Yeah. And, and this is one of the newest books that we're involved with, OM pub published. And it's about Europe. And uh, Debbie Mayroff, a professional writer, gave us that great book, True Grit. We've given away 100,000. In fact, UB, uh, United Christian Broadcasters, yes. gave that away to their prayer partners. 20,000 copies, True Grit. Same author. Yes. It's a bigger book. But it shows what God is doing in Europe as well as the challenge of Europe, and she's especially gifted in showing what Muslims are doing in Europe, and we really need to understand that because it's a great uh, challenge, I think, to the Christian church.
Some of you might consider writing a book, even though you think, well, I can never write a good book. And today, you can just do your book digitally. You don't even ever have to print it. So everybody should get a domain name and then later on maybe have a website. And older people also should get into email. And if possible, into Facebook. I have 5,000 Facebook friends, a great way to talk to your grandkids and the younger generation. And we hear that Facebook and YouTube and Twitter is going to merge. I think even Bill Gates is going to be blown away. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to merge. You haven't heard this? No. Yeah. It's going to be called You Twit Face. <laughs> <laughs> It's a joke. That's a joke. Don't get me any. I don't want one. to be in a court no, case. No, that was. Oh dear, George. Do you do you have? Um, I'm sure you have many favourite scriptures, uh, but which, which? Do you have a scripture that in, encourages you? Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labour is never in vain in the Lord. That's the scripture. And then casting every care. I'm a warrior. You know, casting every care upon him, he cares for you. So I'm, you know, I'm always grabbing those two uh, scriptures. Yeah, I'm saturated with the word of God. I started memorizing it when I was a baby Christian through yes. the influence of godly people. And that's uh, now, I, I have memory problems now, very hard to memorize a new verse, but the old ones, they're there and um, it's, it's helping me to keep going. I think as we get older, to be honest, I'm... Uh, Life gets sometimes more difficult. There's more disappointments. Um, we've had some even in our immediate uh, family. And so we, uh, we have to be renewed day by day by the, by the Lord himself. Yeah. How do you see the future, George? Well, we know someday the Lord is going to return. And I think we're still in a, in a period of tremendous church growth, tremendous uh, really revival. We're very involved in Algeria where my friend Charles Marsh worked for a lifetime with only a couple believers and his daughter, Daisy. And now, um, somehow, we're in the midst of this revival in Algeria, over 100,000 Berber Muslims, all Muslims. Not only decisions, that doesn't mean too much in Muslim countries. They're, they're worshiping Jesus. The Algerian government has approved this church movement. This is a major answer to prayer. So um, we're believing that this kind of breakthrough is going to happen in other countries. Well done for um, persevering and well done for persisting. And um, we pray for you and your wife for uh, continued good health in body, mind, and spirit, and that you'll keep uh, running that race. Thank you. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, Amen. the author and perfecter of our faith. George Burwer, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. John, I support compassion, and compassion supports facing the canon. Please enjoy the film. Changing the world begins with a child. This is Moses. He lives with his foster mother, Mary. She found him left for dead as a newborn baby on a garbage dump. His life is very different today, as he now receives support from a compassion project in the local church. Compassion offers each child they serve the opportunity to learn about Jesus and receive regular Christian training, educational opportunities and help, health care, hygiene training and supplementary food where needed. Together, all this empowers Moses to take his place in the church and the community. 
and to show others the way to break the cycle of poverty. It takes just £21 a month to change the story for a child like Moses. If you want to change the world, it begins with a child. It begins with you, and it can begin now.